I'm going to jump right into it. I'm going to go pretty quick, so um, I can always go back if you need me to. So for Lake Michigan, um, people wonder, well, why you need a, a Lake Michigan management plan? Um, well, for a lot of reasons. Michigan hasn't had one, and uh, we've been managing uh, salmon in this lake and throughout the Great Lakes for over 50 years without a, a plan in hand. We manage the fifth largest lake in the world. We've got um, dune systems, uh, the largest estuary in the world in Green Bay. Um, and as you all know, the first uh, fishing opportunities from recreational, uh, charter boating, river fishing to commercial fishing. And all of this, I think, uh, is worth having a plan to manage it. Um, the lake also gives us a lot of services that you don't always think about. Of course, we think about food, you know, a lot of you are catching fish to, to eat, but it regulates our climate. Um, on this side of the state, you see a lot of the fruit industry built here because of the climate changes of Lake Michigan. It's important for nutrient cycling. I think we all think of, you know, you can see these watersheds flowing into the lake. We all think of nutrients going downstream, but within the lake itself, there's nutrient cycling from the surface bottom to the surface, and um, that happens throughout the season. And, and it's also very important for recreation. Uh, you know, South Haven's no, no exception to that. And we have lots of people living around it, uh, Chicago and the, and the other side of the lake. We also work with a lot of other agencies, and it, it helps for us to be aligned as, as anglers, uh, commercial fishermen, and it, and uh, the DNR, um, so we can help also help communicate with our partners. So I work with obviously Wisconsin, uh, Illinois, Indiana, and also work with five tribal nations that have um, angling rights and are co-managers to to Lake Michigan, and also work with folks that are in this room from U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, NOAA, USGS, uh, Great Lakes Fish Commission. So to give you some background, it took us a few years to get to where we are now, but we started in 2014. Uh, we worked within our citizens advisory group. We then moved into working with different focus groups and things, came up with some uh, draft mission, vision, and goals. Um, brought that out to the public just this past fall uh, in December or so. Some of you may have been at some of those meetings, and we got really good feedback from it and we approved the plan um, this January. So it, it is an approved plan at this point. Um, you can go to the plan to look at this, but we here's our mission, vision, and values. Um, we have the plan set up with different categories. We have very broad goals and objectives that are, I would say, long-term uh, goals that could be 20, 30, even 50-year-old uh, 50 year term goals. Um, we have some strategies underneath those. And then we have tactics that are really what we're going to be doing in the short term. So it's going to drive our, our research, our management, things we want to do in the next year or two. And we're going to evaluate these through outcomes. So we set up a few key outcomes that we can look at to see how the fishery's doing, how we're doing and we're gonna report back to the public with those outcomes on an annual basis. So some of the key outcomes so you can uh, get a flavor for what's in this plan. So we, we obviously don't want any more invasive species. So that's a key part of this um, uh, plan, um, quite a big section on it. We wanna see a lot more connectivity to our river systems. Most of our fishes in Lake Michigan need different habitats to uh, to reproduce, so our goal is, or outcome is, to add 500 more miles of connectivity. Do this through removing dams, do this uh, um, by removing culverts or block culverts and try to connect the fish to important habitats throughout the system. We also want, and this is what we're often talking about at these meetings, balanced predator and prey populations in the lake. And um, you often heard us talk about our predator prey model. We're going to continue to use that, and we're going to continue to adjust stocking up or down to maintain that balance. And much of what I'm going to talk about at the end of this is all about maintaining balance in a diverse fishery in this lake. So um, that's a very important one that we'll continue to seek feedback from you. 
Um, we also want to see a diverse fishery, and we really haven't come out to say what that diverse fishery looks like, but you know, we want it to include Chinook salmon, coho salmon, and steelhead. Um, that's what we've heard the last three years of what anglers really want. And with that, to add to the diversity, um, lake trout and brown trout. Um, so that, that's the salmonid, salmonine fishery that we're going to be striving for. We also understand the, the economic um, importance of this fishery to a lot of communities like South Haven, Holland, or Grand Haven. And so we have a metric for this too, and that's uh, our salmonine or salmon and trout effort. So we can measure this through our creel program. And our goal is 1.1 million hours. And we have dipped down to um, 600, 700,000 hours in the last few years. So we want to bump that up and maintain it at, at a higher level. And uh, we also want to, we do a lot of data collection. Um, my, some of my colleagues in here help us out with that. There's data collection from you, the anglers. We have vessels that go out and collect data. And so that data collection and the, and the analysis that goes with that is very important and is a high priority and an outcome for us. And we also want to continue our outreach and research and, and, and get our financial needs through different collaborations. So that just gives you an idea of some of the topics in the plan. Finishing up here, our plan is not thick. You'll notice it's just, a, I don't know, 10 pages long or so. We tried to make it simple because we want people to look at it and we want to make it adaptable. So this is going to be a living plan. We're going to review it annually and make updates to it based on the feedback that we get from you, from what, what we get from our staff. And um, so it'll be living and it's going to be living on a, and on a, uh, a website. So this is the address where the plan's at. Um, appreciate Michigan Sea Grant helping us out with that. They're hosting this for us. So we have the, the management plan on there now. Um, we've got uh, a list of the contributors that helped us with that. We're also populating, with, with populating it with documents and uh, interesting reports that you might like to see. So we have reports on things you might not hear today, but you're interested in, like lake trout. Um, the predator prey you're going to hear about, but there's a report on there. There's a report on yellow perch, um, a report on the predator prey model. All that stuff that we uh, talk about will be there, and it will be a source of information for you. And here's a big list of folks that helped us out, um, either on focus groups or attended meetings to assist with the development. So one big thing that came out of this is changing the way that we look at Lake Michigan for management. And we kind of coined the phrase zonal management. And what this really is, is, is taking a new approach instead of, I mean, for the last 50 years we've stocked every port um, with just about the same species mix. So every port got lake trout, got uh, <coughs> Chinook salmon, got coho. Maybe not as much coho down here, but uh, brown trout, steelhead. And that worked out really good when we had lots of prey in the lake. And it seemed like the more fish we put out there, the more you caught. But now that we have a new system out there with a little bit lower productivity, everything's had to shift down and we can't put the same amount of fish in every single port throughout the lake. So this is a new effort on our part to, to um, change the way we think about the lake, change the way we stock fish, and to um, inform you all on, on how we're going to do it. So it's, a, it's more habitat-based. And does this have a pointer? So Lake Michigan is relatively deep in the north, um, shallow in the south. Our rivers that run into the lake in the south are big. You got the St. Joe, you got the Kalamazoo, you got the Grand. They're warm, they've got a lot of nutrients going into the lake. Um, creating a little bit different uh, system in the, in the lower part of the lake. Northern part of the lake, like I said, deep, deep close to shore. The river's going into this part. If you've got the Pier Marquette, you've got the Betsy River, they're cold water systems and can often produce a lot more natural reproduction of their salmonids than the southern rivers. So that's something we think about. We need to treat Green Bay much different from the rest of the lake. It's a, it's a shallow water system. 
probably more conducive to your walleye and perch versus salmon. Um, then we've got deep bays like Green Bay, or excuse me, Grand Traverse Bay, which is very deep and cold and is really good for um, trout and salmonids. So it's rather than throwing things everywhere around the lake, we're trying to focus in on what species might do better in different habitats. So we'll think about this not only with stocking, but with our regulations and then how we promote the fishery as well. So smallmouth bass, this is our smallmouth bass zones. And um, in the lake proper, it's mostly this northern part of the lake, around Beaver Islands down to Grand Traverse Bay, we've got the smallmouth bass population that moves around within that area that we know based on tagging information. So we can manage that really as one population, and we might want to manage it with regulations a little bit differently than the rest of the lake. Um, Green Bay, Bay Sinoc, that also has a really good and growing smallmouth bass population, so we may want to manage it a little bit differently there. Um, and then along the coast, if you fish around the mouths of these river systems, around the pier heads, we've got these little local smallmouth bass populations as well. For lake trout, this might be a, a different way of viewing how we might manage for lake trout. Um, in the southern part of the lake, we're starting to see some more natural reproduction. We have less mortality down there. Um, less from sea lamprey, we have less from commercial fishing, <coughs> tribal fishing. Um, so we've been able to reduce stocking quite a bit in the lower part of the lake. The upper part of the lake, and actually in this area, was, was where they historically, lake trout historically spawned on reefs. We're trying to build that population up. Um, we still have fairly high mortality. Um, we've got the sea lamprey mortality down, but it's going to take a while for the population to recover. But we have pretty high mortality from, from recreation and commercial fishing up there. So we're focusing all of our stocking up into this area to try to build that population so we get more spawners and hopefully increase natural reproduction in that area. For brown trout, this is a species that we've been struggling with the last few years. Um, some years, browns do really well at a port, some years they don't. And for the most part, we're finding they don't do well at most of our ports. Um, why is that? Could be temperature changes. You know, they, they're still a trout, they need cold water. They tend to be home bodies. They want to stick around shore more often. And if you're in the southern part of Lake Michigan, on a warm summer, we're getting surface temperatures in the 70s and that's getting a little too warm for those trout. So they need to find refuge. They gotta go out deep, which is way offshore, or get into a tributary, and the tributaries down there are warm too, so there's not a whole lot of places for those trout to seek refuge. Whereas in the north, we've got deep water really close <coughs> to shore, so they could get refuge by going a little deeper, or going into these river systems that are already pretty cold. They stay below uh, 70 degrees year-round for the most part. So we're going to try to focus our stocking into this area, this brown trout zone, for the next three to five years and see if we can increase our return to creel. Um, we've done some analysis of fish stocked in the St. Joe area and it cost us, it, well, the value of a brown trout caught in St. Joe on average is 200 and 40 some dollars a fish. So when you look at what it costs us to raise them, stock them, and how many are actually being harvested there. So that's a pretty expensive fish. Um, we need to do better than that, so let's focus them in um, where we think they'll do better. Coho salmon, we primarily stock the Platte River, because that's our root source, um, Blue, Blue River. Um, but as you all know, the spring is fantastic down here for coho. So we see coho fishing start to develop down in this area, Gary, Indiana, Michigan City, and it works its way up um, typically and then moves over across the lake. Um, what we're trying to do is create more fall fisheries for coho. We got fantastic spring fisheries, as you know. But if we could move some of the stocking south, and concentrate more in these areas, we might be able to produce a little bit better fall fisheries in areas where we've 
lost some of that Chinook fishery. So that's kind of our focus with coho. And with Chinook salmon, I mentioned all the great tributaries to the north that are producing a lot of our wild fish. Um, our theory here is that we want to, the Chinook we stock, we want to start concentrating more in the south or a little bit in the UP in areas that we're not seeing a lot of natural reproduction. Um, and you'll see that in some of our stocking options of trying to get more fish to the south. Steelhead um, seem to be doing really well for us. We seem to stock, we stock them in many different tributaries throughout the lake. I really don't have a strategy different per zone for steelhead, um, but we'll continue to, to stock all these tributaries, you know, St. Joe, Kalamazoo, um, Grand, down in this area. And we can expand this concept for other species that we manage for Cisco, yellow perch, walleye, musky, whitefish, and, and lake sturgeon as well. And I just didn't want to go through those, but we'll be talking about those in a zonal man management concept as, as well. So the rest of the time I'd like to talk about stocking options um, and get some feedback from you all. So you may remember um, it was spring of 2015, uh, Lake Michigan Committee was getting really nervous about the low prey abundance in Lake Michigan. And so we implemented a stocking reduction um, which meant Michigan was going to go down to about 200,000 fish um, in 2016. We heard a lot of negative feedback from groups and at meetings like this, and so we adjusted that, added some different species mixes, and we got that stocking number up to about 330,000. <coughs> um, that was better, but people were still concerned about that, so last year I continued the conversation and we developed some stocking options that would get Michigan's stocking back up to what it was in 2015, which is about 560,000. Um, so we worked on that, talk, took it out to the public last, late last fall. There was approval of that. And then our last step for Michigan, because um, we have waters that are within the 1836 consent decree area, we have to go through a tribal review with the five tribal nations. And some of our, most of our proposals were accepted and, and the one with lake trout was not. So in order to stay within a predator cap that the Lake Michigan Committee has established, Michigan's got to come up with some um, more what I'll call Chinook equivalents. We need about 100,000 more to keep within that predator cap to maintain a good balanced fishery in the lake. So when we start talking about a mix of different species to stock, not all fish are the same. So Chinook salmon, we know primarily feed on alewood. Um, they don't really vary their diet a whole lot from that. And if alewife are gone, Chinook salmon are going to be gone. And that's what we saw in Lake Huron in, in 2004. Other species like coho, one, they're only out in the lake a couple of years, a year and a half, so they're not consuming as much and they got more of a varied diet. So when we look at stocking reductions for coho, we got to reduce three times as many to get the same effect as one Chinook in terms of consumption of alewife. And similar with lake trout, steelhead, or browns, you know, it's almost double the stocking reductions you have to do to achieve the same amount of uh, consumption reduction on alewife. So when we start saying, well, we're going to maintain Chinook, but we want to reduce coho, if you're going to reduce, um, so to make up this 100,000 Chinook equivalents, you'd have to reduce over 300,000 coho to make up for that. So. so where we were um, last year, the public, um, what we heard back from the public is that they were willing to reduce brown trout by 150,000 and concentrate those fish, remaining fish, up into the brown trout zone. Um, coho salmon, the, the, we're basically going to move some south um, as part of the zonal management plan. We we're looking at reducing lake trout by 240,000. These were going to come out of the northern part of the lake, so from Ludington up north of that. 
And Chinook salmon, by doing those other reductions, that'll allow us to bring another 223,000 Chinook back and still maintain you know, a good predator and prey balance in the lake. Um, so this was all good and everything was approved except for the lake trout. So what that means for us now and for stocking in 2019, um, we've got to come up with 104,000 Chinook equivalents. And there's many ways we can do this. We can do it all with Chinook salmon. We can do a little bit of brown trout, coho um, mix, um, and, or a combination of all three. And whatever we come up with, we would adjust in 2019. Um, so everybody knows, actually, this year in 2018, we did stock about 550,000 Chinook. So we did make that increase, and you'll notice some of your net pens, people getting net pens, they had to get an extra one around because more fish are coming to each one of the ports. So we, we have done a, um, have been able to get more Chinook in the system, but we just got to adjust that a little bit for next year. So if we are going to look at this, um, let me back up. So on Tuesday, I presented this information to our Lake Michigan Citizens Fishery Advisory Committee and asked them what they would do. And they came up with actually seven different proposals, but I only have five up here. So one, one option they came up with is just reduce Chinook. Chinook are the easiest thing to reduce. Um, we can do it annually. It's not too much burden on the hatchery system. Um, and they are the primary consumer of ALI. We also had some data on uh, wild fish production. And in 2016, we had really good year class of wild fish. So we should have a good number of two-year-olds out there. In fact, the estimate is about four million fish of wild fish. So um, that's good news for Chinook fishing in the future. So that would be the easiest thing for us to do. Um, brown trout. To make up the difference, we'd have to reduce 228,000, which doesn't leave us with a whole lot of brown trout to work with, but we could deal with that. It takes us a while to make that adjustment because these browns are in the hatchery for 18 months. Coho salmon, to make up the difference, is 330,000 fish. Um, we could do some combinations, as you see there. And to get some feedback on the back wall before you leave or if you take a break, I'm going to have these green dots. And if you don't mind just grabbing the green dot, consider these different options of, um, of what we could do and you know, put the dot on the one that you're, you'd recommend. So and that will help us um, uh, figure out what we're gonna do for next year. And are we getting close on time, Dan? We've got a few more minutes. All right. <clears throat> I just wanted to show you where the proposals were going for stocking. So as I mentioned with brown trout, um, these are all the ports that we stock browns, the numbers now. This is what we were going to go for. Um, so focus all those browns into that management zone. There. So going to, from 506,000 to 356,000. And so as you're thinking of these other options, if we were to do it. has the lowest number. South Haven is going to go to zero. South Haven has the lowest number currently. And yeah, and in fact, it didn't get fished this year because we had to start making up predator reductions. And under our plan moving forward, it would not get browns anymore. And neither would New Buffalo, St. Joe, Saugatuck. I mean, nothing really south, nothing south of Ludington. The coho, this is our coho, and basically the only move is we're mainly moving fish south and added saugatuck um, to the coho stocking. So Kalamazoo River would get some fish. Lake trout, this was our proposal, um, but we're going to be staying with this proposal for the near future. So we've eliminated all lake trout stocking south of Ludington and continue stocking from Ludington North with the majority of the fish going in what we call the northern refuge area. This is where the hot spot is for lake trout spawning habitat. And for Chinook salmon, we've gone to this every other year, and this is close to the numbers that 
the Fort Scott this year. So, um, Saugatuck, South Haven, I think you're close to 75, 80,000 this year. Um, next year is what we're going to have to make some adjustments to if people want to reduce Chinook. So, we might be able to reduce Grand Haven and St. Joe a little bit, as well maybe as Medusa, and we could probably trim some out of the rough landscape. So, that's it. Um, this is a 17 pound steely uh, this fall out of Kalamazoo River. So fishing's been good.